Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Open your Bible and let's go to class with Dr. Murray for a better understanding of our Father's Word. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do some specials here uh, through this segment. And those specials are, the, the first part will be discerning dreams. And why is it important to be able to discern dreams? To discern dreams, that, allow, that keeps you from being deceived. It keeps you from being deceived by who, we might say? By Satan himself. And um, within that, we have the thing that we are most put on guard about in this final generation. Why? The deception that would come. But dreams themselves, what have we been told about them? They're real, and sometimes God speaks to man through dreams. However, we do not allow Satan or some evil force, something of that nature, to deceive us into thinking that uh, a dream we might have would come from a source other than from our Father, and then we purport it to be of our Father. Example, we have a work titled Dreams and Visions, uh, with the body itself having the five, and I like to think sometimes even six senses. If if it's very hot in a room and you're sleeping, you might dream of fire. That's simply your body telling you, hey, it's too hot. That message doesn't come from God. It doesn't come from Satan. It doesn't come from a good spirit, nor does it come from a bad spirit. It's your own uh, sensors that speak to the mind telling you you're uncomfortable. Many times a sour pickle at night, late at night, can give you dreams and visions. So, therefore, only you yourself can determine uh, your dreams or discern them, mainly because of meditating on the spirit which might have given you the dream. Now, let's document from our Father's Word. We know that in dreams and visions of times old, such as with Daniel, who was the discerner certainly of dreams, he had that gift from our Father, that dreams, God spoke to people through dreams, such as even Nebuchadnezzar, with Daniel interpreting that dream. But how about today? Does it still happen today? Well, I don't know. Let's go to our Father's Word, and let's do a little research on discerning dreams. Let's first ask the question, does God speak to people through dreams or visions? Let's start in Matthew chapter 1. And I'll tell you what let's do. This is one of the greatest events, the greatest event that, and greatest gift that ever came to man, the birth of Christ. Uh, Mary had conceived, and Joseph learned of it. And he was very upset because he had not been with Mary. And he was thinking even of putting her away. And then this event happened in chapter 1, verse 20 of Matthew. Let's go to it, if we may, at this time. But while he thought on these things, this being Joseph, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. How did the angel appear? In a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, or the whole, better translated, the Holy Spirit. So the very announcement of Christ's birth to Joseph, the conception uh, from Mary, that very announcement itself fortified and made known unto Joseph by uh, this dream. So, and, and even again, uh, let's go to the second chapter of Matthew. 
And let's take verse 12. Listen to this. Did God deliver messages through dreams? The angel of the Lord is the Lord. You understand that it's the Holy Spirit speaking directly. Verse 12 of chapter 2, Matthew, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. In other words, God, yes, speaks through dreams. He spoke to Joseph, warning of the a decision by Herod to kill all children under two. Verse 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord approached to Joseph in a dream. How? In a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod <clears throat> will seek the young child to destroy him. So we see beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes, God does speak to people in dreams. Now, in this day and age, we have many people that says, I heard from the Lord. And the Lord said this to me, or the Lord said that to me. Now, be very careful of this. That can be become almost flippant the way some would say things of this nature. To have the Father speak to you is an awesome thing, whether in a dream or auditable. Just, it, it is an awesome experience, a very moving experience. And Father doesn't deal with nonsense. So therefore, probably the first lesson I would like to state from my own experience, and, and this is from the Father, any time that you are given a dream or a vision, and it happens to be, um, or at least you're considering that it's from the Father, you will always find that it does not differ with this word. You will find it within this word that it is in fact a part of God's plan. God will never give you anything that is outside of his plan. And therefore, we know that uh, the Father speaks to his servants, but he doesn't speak every hour, he doesn't speak every minute, and he doesn't speak every day. He expects his true servants to be able to function on their own in most cases. Very rarely will our Father speak to his servants, unless it be at a time of need, a time of trouble, or a time of fulfilling the plan of God. Now, we knew that now that some would say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Is it possible that God would still speak to people through dreams and visions in this generation? Well, let's turn over to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts, and we'll take it at chapter 2. And let's pick it up with verse 16. Acts chapter 2, verse 16, you'll remember what had happened. It was Pentecost Day. And the men began to speak in a clear tongue, understandable in every language. They heard clearly what they stated even in the dialect of within the county of which they were born, the place of the foreigner's birth, that sound was the voice of his native place of birth, which is to say that's when you can identify the presence of the Holy Spirit when you hear someone speak, and if there are 50 languages in the room, they're going to hear it clearly. It's not unknown, as is often thought by misunderstanding the Scripture. Acts 2, chapter 7 very clearly defines that. Now, what about, does God speak in this day to people in dreams and visions? Let's check it out. As Peter begins to explain what had happened when the Holy Spirit spoke with evidence by the interpreting in openly into every language with clarity, 
Peter states, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. There, this is what Joel was talking about. If you, if you study the book of Joel, you even know what they said and what, they, what the subject was that was coming from their mouth on this day of Pentecost. Verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. W when are the last days? I personally feel this is the final generation, so that makes this the last days. In other words, Peter is speaking of now and forward, even to the very time of the speaking in this tongue of all languages. It isn't time yet, but it will be when you are delivered up as it is written in Mark 13, not to premeditate, but to allow this cloven tongue, the, the, every language in the world. Man can't fake that because it's a divine intervention by Almighty God. In the last days, said God, I want to fix the time, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So, yes, we do see that God, even up to the point of the very end, will allow his people to speak in dreams and visions. Not only allow, it will be the duty of God's elect. So what can we determine from this then? Yes, there would be dreams and there would be visions right up to the very point of the end. And within this, we see a promise. You can read in the book of of uh, Joel, that when the locust army would come from the north and the false messiah, that same locust army that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 9, that will uh, stand in the holy place claiming to be the very chosen of God, when in fact their leader is Apollyon, which is to say Antichrist, which is to say the destroyer Satan. And that is the reason for the dreams and the vision and the prophecy by the sons and daughters that serve the living God, that have filled their minds with the Word of God and are, have the ability to discern the teaching and the prophecies of men as to whether or not they be true. That's what it's all about. And there's only one way, my friends, you can do that, and that is to know the Word of God. At least to have the ultimate or the simple flow, better said, of God's plan from beginning to end as to how He would bring about the end in the end times, as to how He would touch and speak through, not they speaking, but He speaking through his servants, uh, and I assure you, they shall come to pass. Now, what about these people that say, well, God told me where to park my car today, or I heard from God, this one-upmanship, or try, I think sometimes I think ministers get in a habit of t trying to talk to each other rather than teaching or preaching to those that they're supposed to trying to impress each other with who has the closest walk with God. Well, we happen to be all equal in that. It is true that God has a little more work for some servants than he does others, but we're all the same in God's eye. He's not a respecter of persons, and he doesn't have any pretty boys or girls that uh, are his favorites. He depends more upon those that will humble themselves and open themselves and be willing to serve. Okay, I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy for a moment. Let's talk about the penalties, if we may, of false dreamers. And there is a penalty. Let's, let's go to Deuteronomy, if we may, chapter 13. Here, way back in the beginning, the law, has, and it's very current to this day. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 of this chapter 13 in the book of Deuteronomy. Listen and learn from your father's word. 
if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, well, God spoke to me today, this sort of thing, verse 2, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. If uh, What God is saying here, if he gives you a message, if it comes from his mouth, that he gives you a message that is totally contrary to the word of God, anyone should be intelligent enough to know this is a false dreamer. In other words, this, this is what I even call a dreamer, an imaginer, an imagination that kind of runs away with a person. All right? Verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know. What is it that God does? God proveth thee, that's you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Hey, he's jealous. And when these people that come around saying, I heard from God or God told me this and this flippant attitude and mannerism, be very cautious because the chances are God didn't send them and what they tell you might be contrary to God's word and they will ultimately have you worshiping other gods and what our Father is concerned about, though that may sound, well, that's Old Testament and we don't certainly don't worship mythical gods. That's not what he's talking about. There is a false god showing up on this earth that most of the world will worship. And if you listen to these dreamers that God sent me here or God sent me there or God said this to me without checking them out in God's word, you're going to end up worshiping him too. That's why the majority will worship him. It's a very, very serious subject. Verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him. Well, let's do revere him. And keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. How do you do that? He wrote you a letter. He sent you a copy of his entire plan, all of it, that applies to human in this earth age. And it tells you he loves you enough that he told you exactly what he would do. And if some nut or dreamer comes along trying to tell you something different, he expects you to be intelligent enough to say, bug off, butt out. Verse 5. And that prophet, that false prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, that false idol dreamer, shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, ultimately and through prophecy and what that was even symbolic of was to deliver us from bondage through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, to trust, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. In other words, a dreamer of visions can have a very evil influence on you and your community by saying the Lord saith thus and the Lord saith that and the Lord didn't speak. A dreamer spoke, and dreamers had better awake because God will put them to death. It is a very, very serious thing when you go about setting yourself up as a deliverer of dreams when God didn't give it to you. It was a sour pickle. It's a very, very serious thing. You might say, well, how serious could it be? If you get in God's way, he can cause you to become uh, 
poor when you're prosperous. He can cause everything to go wrong for you. And you deserve it if you're a false dreamer. It's that serious. He's very jealous of his children because it is not as though you had cost a man a dollar, which some people consider to be very serious. But it is as though you had robbed a man of his soul and the soul of his family and the soul of those that he will plant that same wicked, evil seed to. D untruths, lies. That's why God said put him to death. Well, God will take care of that part of it himself. Why did I cover that particular scripture? So that you could realize the seriousness. It is not a flippant religious thing when some character comes on with this, well, God spoke to me this morning, and I said, God, how am I going to do this? And he answered me saying, you know better than that. You're an intelligent human being. God doesn't, most of the times it's something so simple, if they had read the scripture, they would have known without making up a bunch of trash anyway. Am I saying that God doesn't speak to people? Oh, he does. He does. But I am highly suspect, and I won't judge. God can handle that part of it himself. When some preacher, especially, starts spewing off these conversations they held with God one-on-one, -on -one, because 99 times, 99.98% of the time, it's a lie. And that's not judging. That's just using a little wisdom to know they're blowing hot air. Do I do that to condemn them? No, but to warn them because we're in the final generation. And I know personally that most of the time God speaks to us, it's not something we're even allowed to repeat. And they seem to enjoy. It is usually an instruction that is private. Wake up and smell the roses, you prophets, that carry on one-on-one -on -one conversations with God. It would seem that oftentimes it is used to get the worship from a congregation that, oh, God really speaks to him. Yes, God. I wish God would speak to me that way. Well, you wouldn't want speaking to you what that character has speaking to him or her, all right? You, you don't deserve that. I'll tell you this. I know many times it's done in playing church, but listen to me, dreamers, and listen to me, ye that see visions, and God didn't say anything. We're in the final days. And I would not want to be accountable for what ye are. I will not judge you. Again, do I do this to upset? No, but to warn. Okay, so let's, let's backtrack just a moment here. Does God speak to people in dreams? Yes, he spoke to Joseph about the birth of Christ. Is it for this day? Yes, because in the book of Acts, we know that that tongue that is spoken at the very end when people are delivered up before the false Jesus, the false God, that many of them will be um, instructed, the old men is particularly in dreams, of what it is that they are to do. So certainly that makes it valid right up to the last minute of this earth age. But at the same time, are there false dreamers? Yes. And unfortunately, if you are not wise enough to understand the senses that God, through the miracle body he gave us, the sense of touch, the um, sense of temperature even, all the, the various senses of feel and touch and taste and, and so on and so forth, that they, they speak to us also. Be wise in the ways of our Father. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah, if we may. Let's, let's, let's check out this dream just a little further. Jeremiah chapter 23. 
And uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, oh, let's see. Let's pick it up in verse 15. Let's see some more. Let's see what our Father has to say about dreamers. Jeremiah 23, verse 15, and it reads, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. And naturally, you know, these are false prophets. Je Revelation chapter 8 will tell you about wormwood, the false prophets of Satan that say, I spoke to God today. Be careful, my friend, and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land, hypocrisy. You see, with the media that we have in this day and time and able to reach the people that we do to give a false dream or to say, God told me this and I answered, and then he answered me, can be a very dangerous thing when unbelievers hear the word of God spoken by false lips. Verse 16, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. That means empty air. They speak a vision of their own heart, their own fancy, of their own mind, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. I didn't send them. That's what God is saying. Do you understand what this is talking about? Let me tell you, if you, if you uh, can't remember exactly. There were some prophets when Jeremiah said, we're going into the captivity of Babylon. The same as you can update this. The type is there are many going around today saying, we're not going into captivity of the Antichrist, which is simply to say, he's not coming because we're going to be gone. That's the same idiocy that these people were putting out. You're not going through it. It's going to be all over in two years. Well, it happened to be 70 years in the presence of that king of Babylon. And so it will be only the king of Babylon in the spiritual um, connotation given forth in the book of Revelation is instead of Christ, or to say Antichrist. Verse 17. And they say, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, God said to me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination, after their stubbornness, of his own heart, his own fancy, no evil shall come upon you. Don't worry about understanding the book of Revelation, though God wrote it through John and presented it and gave it a title meaning the unveiling, meaning the word revelation. There are prophets and false preachers that will tell you you don't have to worry about the revelation because you're going to be gone anyway, and that is a lie. It is a falsehood that has come forth from the lips of man. God did not say it. This was a type of a warning that you should be on guard against false churches and false teachers. Do they do it deliberately? No, they listen to man and man's traditions rather than the Word of God. It is a very serious, serious thing to lead people under the name of Christ to worship Satan. Verse 18, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word. Question. These people that say, well, I spoke to him and he spoke back to me. Have you really stood in the counsel of God? I think not. Who hath marked his words and heard it? His private thoughts. He wrote this word to you. This is his word. And if you spent more time teaching it, rather than putting on sideshows of one-on-one -on -one upmanship, you would feel the blessings of God. Then you wouldn't have to beg for money to buy some miserable time. God would see that you had the time purchased. 
through people that are intelligent in this land and that are very tired of one-upmanship by so-called spiritualist. Verse 19, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The lawless one, yes, and those that practice one-upmanship. And verse 20, The anger of the Lord shall not return. He's not going to change his mind until he hath executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. That's to say what's in his mind. In the latter days, when? Now. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. Do you know why? Consider, I mean, you're going to understand it perfectly in the latter days. Why? You're going to see God fry them. You're going to see God get their attention. Do I mean by that he's going to destroy them? No. They're going to have to study under disciplined Christian teachers, and that will be a heartache to them and their one-upmanship practices. Verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. I talked to God today, and he said back to me, be careful, my friend. There are many that know what you're doing. You may deceive some, but you will never deceive God, and he's listening to you. It really turns him off your case. Verse 22. Now, I, I, let me make one thing very clear. If God leads a man, then let him lead. Again, I'm not judging. But it just so happens that after 40 years of being in his service, and yes, receiving instruction, I know you don't go around running to the people to say, guess what? God spoke to me today. You do what he bids you do. And I certainly know it's not what many are doing. Verse 22, but if they had stood in my counsel, if they had understood my mind, God says, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. And they went, well, how do I stand in the counsel of God? Well, fool, his word. Well, are we upset, son? I didn't say mormos to the Greek word that Christ said don't call anyone. That is to say you're calling someone totally void of any possibility of divine intervention in their life. Well, there's always that possibility. But what he's saying is, if you had studied this word, knowing I wouldn't give you some word that is outside of this word, you would have been intelligent enough to, to, to not play one-upmanship. Why? Well, how would I know God's word? It is written. Verse 23, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? <laughs> He's very near. 24, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? I assure you, no. Do not. I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. I'm everywhere. And with this stuff you say I said, and I didn't say it, who do you think you're kidding? Twenty-five. I have heard what the prophet said. Twenty-six. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart their own minds, their own fancy. 27, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor and as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. As they teach this flyaway stuff to accept the first Messiah that comes that is Baal himself. What are they teaching? Baal worship. 
screen and repeated it before two hotshot preachers. And they ran all over each other getting it in their next newsletter. It's history, friend, church history, about flying away. And the woman herself said it felt very evil when I first received it. But by the time the preachers got through patting her about it, she felt good about it. And my, how it has magnified to this day, and it is totally contrary to the Word of God. God didn't say it. It isn't written in His Word, and yet it is one of the major subjects taught in the world today. Verse 28, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, this word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is chaff? What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? In other words, their lies will, will be treated as chaff among the golden grain of my word, the truth. That's why I will teach his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and let the one uppers up one another. No pun intended. 29. Is not my word like as a fire? You know what fire does to chaff? That's what's going to happen to them saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces, God's word is able to produce itself. God's word is able to make room for itself. God's word will uh, not send forth a bunch of beggars that have to beg and plead and promenade and beat to death a bunch of poor people to keep their miserable one-upmanship on the airways. God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, let God's Word fall. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor, not from the written, but from what some man says, his neighbor, traditions. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues, and say, he saith, God talked to me, yes, I heard from God today. 32, behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not. I didn't call them to preach. I didn't send them nor commended them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. In other words, they are worthless as far as receiving blessings from God through something like that that is false. Hard, yes, God's word is hard against liars. If the shoe fits, wear it. Otherwise, rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in his word that his word is true, and it is fire, for God is a consuming fire, and God's word is able to stand on its own. There is a book, and it's called The Ecclesiastes, that was written to the man that walks under the sun. I want to go to chapter 5 in that book of Ecclesiastes real quickly. In other words, this tells you how to be happy even in this flesh body. This, this book of Ecclesiastes, it is a, a Hebrew idiom written to the man that walks under the sun, meaning a man in a flesh body, not an angelic body or a spiritual body. Therefore, written to you so that you can have that completeness. And we read in verse 1 of chapter 5. Keep, the foot, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Oh, yes, I'm just an humble servant because God said to me this morning, you should have post-toasties instead of that other brand. Verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. You'd better search the Word. You can't go wrong teaching God's Word. But your own Word might chaff his hide. 
And if you chaff God's hide, he's going to chaff yours, my friend. Thing before God, for God is in heaven, he's on the throne, and thou upon earth, little one. Therefore, let thy words be few, and let God's word be read much, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Three, for a dream, listen to me, dreamers, for a dream cometh through the multitude of businesses, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words, chatter, chatter, chatter. One verse Charlie's, one verse from God, and ours by the little ratchet jaw. It is all right that an evangelist use one verse, but a teacher of God's Word, if he only brings forth one verse, then he's not teaching much of God's Word, and, but a great deal of his own. Four, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Five, better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. If you promise um, God that you're going to do a certain thing, he hears you. Best to keep your word. Now, that's not making promise to some man that you're going to send him everything you own, including the keys to your car. That's, that's, that's uh, only a fool would do that. That isn't written anywhere in God's Word that you are to do that. But this is to the Father himself. Six, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Don't let your mouth overload your feet. Neither say thou before the angel, what angel? The angel of God, that it was an error. I made a mistake. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? And my friends, he has done it many times. God is quite able to govern his own house. Verse 7, For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, that's empties, but fear thou God, you must remember him. I want to go to Ezekiel real quick, 44. You're already in the millennium here. Will it be, how will it be in the future yet, even in the millennium? This is written to the Zadok, meaning the just, God's elect that shall teach at that time. I want to go to verse 23, and I want to cover it with you. This is God's instructions to those that will stand up and witness against Satan when he is on this earth, telling everyone he's come to rapture them away very soon. He's loading his bus, and you that stand against him, this is your instruction for even the millennium. What is it? Verse 23 of Ezekiel 44. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and and profane, and cause them to discern, I repeat, to discern between the unclean and the clean. How about you? Can you discern between a dream from the evil one and a dream that is from the Father? There's only one way you can discern that, and that is to be familiar with the plan of God. If someone starts driving your little old carcass in a different direction other than what God says, they're a false leader, a false teacher. God says he has a people that, through the words of Christ himself, and we'll pick up with those words in the next lecture, of what exactly you are to do and how you are to discern whether someone is misleading you concerning your, I mean you, and your Savior gathering back together. How is it going to happen, and how can you discern? God will always have teachers that will teach his children how to discern between truth and fiction. 
You do it by using his words, his words as your governor. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, please. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular disc. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. All right, there we are back again, bless your heart. Hey, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you an 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. Now, that number good from uh, Puerto Rico all the way up through the states, Alaska, Hawaii, and even our great neighbors to the north, Canada. If you wish to pay your own toll, the area code is 501-787-6026. Those of you that listen by shortwave around this great world of ours that God has given us as uh, the ultimate um, satellite on which his almighty throne shall set throughout the eons, this planet Earth. Uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address and how wonderful it is that we can share the Word of God together in the many-membered body that stretches around this globe. If you have a prayer request, take it to Him. He hears you now. Father, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. All right, hey, let's get into some questions here real quickly. And, um, we're going to be picking back up this, this uh, lecture on discernment. It, it could be your very soul that you're discerning. It's important. Okay, Roy Lee from Arkansas. The Bible puts so much emphasis on suffering. Is it a divine law or order of things? Well, I, I don't know that um, emphasis is placed on the suffering. It is simply the reporting of the suffering uh, because God is hopeful that most people will recognize all Satan is fit for is to cause you to suffer, but the main suffering that should be emphasized is the loss of your soul. And that shall happen at the end of the millennium for those that do not have faith in Yahweh, the creator of all things. That's what real pain is. That's what real suffering is. The suffering and the pain that we have now is simply a jumbling of the nerves. And yes, I know that is terrible. But it is far worse to have pain at the, after the fact. And I repeat for those that maybe were not listening closely, after the fact of having lost your soul at the end of the millennium will be the greatest pain that will have ever been known before or after. And it is quite apparent that 
it will be felt by many, for there will be many deceived. Okay, let's go with William from California. If a Christian recognized the Antichrist and spit in his eye and turned his back on him, would Jesus accept him when he returned? God bless you, pastor and staff. Well, William, you be careful. I know it's real easy to want to do that, but go back to the instructions, and a good servant always follows and disciplines himself mentally and spiritually to be able to do it the way Christ said to do it. It states from the mouth of Christ, when ye are delivered up, take no thought beforehand about spitting in his eye, but speak that that is given to you at that time, that speak you, because it's not you that do it, William, but the Holy Spirit, all right? That we must do for the sake of God's children that the true vision can come through that person delivered, whereby the people and the children are not deceived. Okay, Sue from California. When Jesus comes back, uh, will the backsliders be saved? Well, anytime someone has been, has accepted Christ or saved, however, you, that's what being saved means, is to believe upon Him. You'll never perish. It takes repentance. And many times when we judge people to be severe backsliders, we don't know personally when they might have said, Lord, forgive me. Because God doesn't even know about those things anymore. They are erased. But, and now to answer your question, in the millennium, those that have not had an opportunity to learn the truth, and, and many Sue will say, well, how could anyone not know the truth? There's preachers on every network and channel and so forth. Hey, how's the person? That's one of the major reasons a person doesn't have an opportunity to know the truth. Because this church or this denomination or this church system, this tradition of men will say, if you don't join our church, you're going to hell for sure. And this was that there ain't going to be nobody in heaven but us of this cloth. Or in the middle, you better listen to me or you're going to burn like a piece of bacon in hell. You know? Uh, well, that's not what God says. God says, read my word after you hear some prophet speak. Listen to the one that teaches my word. We read that. Did we not in Jeremiah? Did you hear it? Listen to the one that teaches my word, not some fancy of his own mind. So you can't go wrong by discerning and always, always stick with the word of God. But God will not judge someone to death because though you or anyone else might think a lot of them had a chance, they haven't got a prayer with what most are teaching. Okay, Kurt from Washington. Could it be possible for the Antichrist to be revealed anywhere other than in the Middle East? Uh, not, I mean, I wouldn't let it surprise me if that were to be the case, but he will be revealed in the Middle East because it states in God's Word that that's where he will reappear, all right? And naturally, where does Christ himself appear? On the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14 as well as many, many other places. Satan is the great imitator playing Christ. He's got to do it just the same way, to appear that way. And with his miracles, many people will be deceived. Okay, Naomi from California. After we have placed something in God's hands, can we still pray about it? Well, you, you can say, Father, I'm glad that I've turned it over to you, and, and I'm looking forward to your answer. Nothing wrong with that. In the name of Christ, Michael from Texas. In a book I ran across, it said that there were no enemies anywhere, only love. What do you think of this? You really wouldn't want to know, okay? You really wouldn't want to know. I mean, if there's no enemy anywhere, where's Satan? Okay, I, I would, I would, uh, I'll tell you what I would do. I would run to file 13 and I would run so fast that the little book would lose its covers even, okay? K from Wisconsin. Did you say, if you have ever thought you were Jesus, that this was a sin unto death? I, no, I've never said that because I don't entertain the thought of someone thinking they're Jesus. I know there's one or two 
nuts running around that think they're Jesus, all right, but um, they're not even, they're, you don't even have to, con there's no way they could commit the unforgivable sin because they're so far out in boom, boom land that their ignorance is their cloak of innocency. No, I didn't say that. I was very ill one time and I had strange thoughts. Well, with chemical imbalances in the flesh and illness, uh, that sort of thing, you don't have anything to worry about. God is very intelligent, Kay, dear, and He understands, all right? Just um, repent of any and everything and it's gone, it's forgotten. Hollis from California. In Ezra, God couldn't bless Israel because Kenites became scribes. Well, through the, through the Nethanim they did, but there were other races other than Kenites that were Nethanim, okay? That's a liturgical term that means given to service. Can God bless the USA today when they are ruling our country today? Well, He does. He blesses it because we're the superpower of superpowers. It could be a lot worse than what our good old media um, reports. It's never quite as bad as the good old media reports. If you have been doing it God's way, you're a lot better off than most with God's blessings. I think God blesses us a great deal. I have to say that because He has allowed a little church in Northwest Arkansas to gain a ministry that is growing at such a rate that it is astounding, but I know who causes it. God does. He blesses us here, and, it, and we go all around the world now. And I thank our Father for that in the simplicity of teaching His Word. Uh, wise, as it is written, God's wise are wiser than the serpent and His children, and they have the victory over them today. The people, as long as they are led properly, still lead this nation, all right? Though there are, there are plans that I'm very familiar of. I know that some of you have got to know that I've been in the ministry 40 years. I understand the Illuminati. I understand all the various uh, this, that's, and the other. And I teach the Word of God and defeat them. We're out of time. I love you all so very much for a very special reason. You enjoy that word and you enjoy getting into it and letting your father speak and you listen. That's what's important. Why am I proud of you? Because you're children of God and you do his work. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. If we have helped you, help us reach others. Once you do that, bless God. You know what? He will always bless you. But most important, the thing that's most important for you to do, and that's this. Stay in His Word every day, and it's a beautiful day. You know why? Jesus is the living Word.